Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Hackensack University Medical Center, Wells Fargo, and by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, making healthcare work. Hi, I'm Steve Adubato. Welcome to Caucus, New Jersey. Thousands of children are born each year with a heart condition. Joining us here in the studio to talk about the latest breakthroughs in testing and treatment of this devastating diagnosis are Dr. Robert Tazi, Chief of Pediatric Cardiology at Hackensack University Medical Center. Lisa Sahlberg, CEO and founder of the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association, who is living with HCM, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Joan Helfman is Northern New Jersey American Heart Association board member and cardiovascular nurse. And finally, James, we can call him Jimmy on this show, Skiba, is living with HCM and has survived numerous cardiac arrests. Folks, this is part of our Healthy New Jersey series that we are uh, just kicking off. Please log on to our website to get more information. But the first thing I want to ask you, Dr. Tazi, what is HCM and why does it matter to us? Well, this is a disease that literally makes your muscle of your heart thicker and stiffer. And that, you know, when you work out, your muscle gets tense. That's great for muscles. That's not great for the heart muscle. It's a hereditary disease, something that runs in families for the most part. Um, but it is a unique disease in that I call it a sneaky disease. Sometimes it can be very mm -hmm. aggressive, and the majority of the times it's very benign. How do we know a child has it? Oh, well, that's the big question. We really don't know many times unless we know about the family or if unfortunately there's symptoms. Uh, the symptoms tend to be a later thing. We, we like to try and catch it before there's symptoms. It's interesting, and your situation, Lisa, is just extraordinary. You had a family history of HCM. Yes, Describe I do. Describe it. Well, we knew my grandfather died suddenly and unexpectedly at the age of 43, but that was back in 1953. Then my aunt died from a stroke a few years later. We didn't know they were connected at the time. Then my uncle was diagnosed with something called IHSS, which is the old name for HCM. And then my sister was diagnosed. Unfortunately, in 1990, my uncle died. In 1995, my sister died. My sister was 36 years old. I was eight months pregnant when she died. I was diagnosed with HCM when I was 12 years old in 1979. And when I had my daughter, I wondered if she had This it is too. Rebecca. This is Rebecca. Who is six, 15 right now? She's 15 right now. Go ahead. And. Uh, so I'm eight months pregnant with my, my daughter. Wait, what are we looking at right there? That's my daughter jumping a horse. That's what a 15-year-old with HCM can do if she's well managed and treated. Hold, hold on, Rebecca was diagnosed with it. Rebecca was diagnosed when she was 10. What, were you convinced that she had it? What, I mean, Our family was involved with genetic research early on and I was able to identify the gene that caused our HCM when she was seven. So I knew her genetic status when she was seven. And before I move to the rest of the group, what do you do about it once you're diagnosed? What have you done? Well, we've done a few things with her. Number one, we've modified her exercise to sports that are appropriate for her heart, and equestrian is appropriate for her heart. Secondly, she's on a beta blocker, so she takes a, a drug every day, and she has an implantable defibrillator, one of these little devices. Yeah, let's talk about this. Implanted in her chest. This is an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. It's implanted mostly under the pectoral, or mine's under the pectoral muscle, I have one too. Hers is under the skin, on her chest. What does it do? It monitors every heartbeat, and if it the heartbeat goes heartbeat. Go ahead, I'm sorry. erratic, it goes into fibrillation, it issues a shock, and it brings the heart back to normal rhythm. And, and Jimmy, you were saying before, it's interesting, th this has evolved tremendously, right, Doctor, the technology. How big were they? We were putting them in kids, right? Little kids. How big were they? They, they were, I had a child who was about three years of age where it was like a fist inside his belly and you could actually see it bulge out and it was many years ago. It was in the first kind of uh, series of these defibrillators that came out and they've evolved beautifully uh, to these very unique and very important devices. And Jimmy, you had your uh, recent, three weeks ago, Two weeks ago, Two weeks I ago had, you had one put in. Uh, another one put in. I'm on about my tenth one, technically. Your tenth um, defibrillator. Tell us your history, by the way. You in, survived several cardiac arrests, right? Right. In 1988, I first went into cardiac arrest during playing gym in school, and I was able to survive it through people 
performing CPR on me, and the medics came and everything else. And then in 1990, again, I happened to be working at a family friend's house, and I stepped outside of the house, and I went into cardiac arrest, and a doctor happened to be walking in the facility and started performing CPR, and the ambulance came, and I survived it, and I woke up, and I was Your referred heart to... Yes, stop. Several times. Several times, yes. And what do people think when this is going on? Because in, in the notes that I read leading up to the show, I, I don't want to name names, but teachers, gym teachers, <clears throat> uh, adult professionals around you as a kid when you were in school, they didn't get it. They thought, no, what are you doing, was, Jimmy? It was, you know, it was a different time. It was 1988 when it first started. It was just the disease was really unaware, especially in the school system, that they didn't know. I, teachers were asking if I had did drugs or anything else or you know what because they just can't understand why a 16 year old would go into cardiac arrest at the time you lost jobs because of this yes I did I worked I was working a high school job in um, a big chain store and I was told that I needed to go and push ca carriages carts from the from the shopping um, from the parking lot. You told rather. him you couldn't do it. Told him I couldn't do it. They fired me on the spot. They said if I'm a boy, that all the boys have to participate in pushing carts. I said I can't do the. I, you know, I just can't do it because I have a heart condition. And that's before I had the defibrillator in as well. Before. By the before way, fo folks, this is part of our new series called Healthy New Jersey. Log on to our website. We're going to tell you everything we can about HCM, which stands for again, doctor. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You may not be able to pronounce it, folks, but you're going to. It's important that you know what it is. Joe, I'm to get you into this conversation. The American Heart Association. What have you been doing in this area, particularly um, to raise awareness and help young people struggling with this? The American Heart Association is very into education. You know, on their website, heart.org, you can find all information. Uh, we'll connect to your website. Yes. Uh, connect to ours. We'll bring you to. Heart.org. Heart Go ahead. Correct. Um, raising awareness of CPR. I mean, it's so important in Jimmy's case that everyone knows how to do CPR. Um, I myself had resuscitated my own son at age three. You um, did it yourself? I did it myself. Well, fortunately, I mean, it was, I was a nurse. I was trained for so many years. My husband, being a doctor, was with me at the time. My child collapsed in my arms, Steve. And, you know, of course, I wanted to do the same. You're scared. You're a mother. You're not a nurse at that point. What's the but message you want to give to all the parents message right I want at to this get moment to all, about this? My husband, as he started the breathing, all I kept hearing was what the American Heart Association had taught me. Get help. Call 911. Get the ambulance there. Wait for them. Show them where the victim is. Make sure you're going through all the steps. American Heart has a kit, anytime CPR, that anyone in 22 minutes can learn how to resuscitate. There's no excuse not to know CPR. There's no excuse. Heimlich maneuver, choking, any emergency that comes up, we need to be prepared. Doctor, I see you're shaking your head. How much of the issue, um, this program is called Healing a Child's Heart, we're focusing in this particular edition on, on HCM. How much of this is about public awareness, dealing with it and trying to improve the situation? A tremendous amount is about public awareness. I can honestly tell you that this calendar year, that there's, I, I know of one child who arrested in a public place. Arrested meaning cardiac, the cardiac arrest. Heart stopped. Heart stopped. And I actually did the timeline, and it took um, over two minutes before CPR was started, and over um, about three minutes when the defibrillator got there. What did, what did, talk about those two and three minutes, what the significance really uh, is. It's, it's the difference of life and death or sequelae, meaning is the child going to come back and be great like Jimmy is? Or is the child going to come back with multiple medical problems? And it's, it's minutes. And it's very hard. This is a very, it's a very emotional issue for parents, for people that are there. But there's also this, uh, what happens when someone arrests, and I've actually reviewed these videos, reviewed them for Hank Gathers. Hank Gathers, the great uh, athlete. That died on the court. That's right. Mm -hmm. I reviewed the timeline for that. I have the original footage for that. Is this with the Boston Celtics? I remember. No, no that's a whole, oh, that that's was, that Reggie was, Lewis. Oh, my God. That was, uh, was actually, Lewis. was he a college athlete with, yeah. with Hank? Yes. This, so it happens. I remember. I'm, I'm sorry for getting it wrong. It's video. happened to too many athletes. So uh, it was Len Bias I was thinking of. So it happens. Horrible much, video. He's on the, see, this is what happens, and this is a very important thing to get out to everyone. When someone is on the ground 
And even if they look like they're seizing, even if they look like they're gasping, they are not breathing and their heart's not beating. So you have to start the CPR. What happens is when you're in this, in essence, dying phase, you're moving, you're twitching, you're getting motion. People are afraid to start doing the things that need to be do done. And you watch these videos, it's horrible, but that's what's going on. Did no one, did they just not act quickly enough? They didn't perceive, and this happens, unfortunately, they don't perceive that the person is really, truly arrested. Say, if, say you're there, but you don't know CPR yourself. How difficult is it, or how easy is it to start yelling, hey, who knows CPR, like immediately in that moment? Is that what you do? Absolutely. There's, someone goes down, the first thing people should do is someone who can get help, get help. The defibrillator is key. I mean, there is nothing more important than getting that defibrillator into the room. Where should it be right now? Like, let's deal with schools all across the state of New Jersey. And we're seeing in six or seven states right now, but let's deal with New Jersey. Is there a law right now that says it has to be in every school? No. 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 It's not. And what's the reason for that? Is it an economic thing? It's, well, surely it's an economic. There's, there's, but I will tell you, there's technology out there that's going to make a big difference, and this is what we have to uh, really key into. There's an iPhone app. An iPhone app. That when you hit the, the iPhone app and say there's a cardiac arrest, uh, it's, there's a part of, in California where it's programmed in. It's not available in this area yet. But literally what happens is a message goes out to all iPhone and phone users within a certain area to ask for someone who can do CPR. Right. Mm -hmm. And it tells you the closest external cardiac defibrillator to your site. That happens to be registered with them. Right. There, there are some issues. Right. That's, but we don't have it here. We in, don't have yeah. it. But these are concepts that if we're okay. going to be spending money, and you know, what good is a device if you don't know where it is? Right, right. Uh, let, me, let me try this, because one of the things I was thinking about in preparation for this show is um, how, how, do you, how do we help inform parents without scaring parents? I've got just the perfect thing for that, Steve. You're good. You, you're going to have your own show soon, so go ahead. <laughs> Talk to us, Lisa. So the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association is the organization I founded after my sister died. Now, you founded it. I did. You said we need an organization like this. I, I did. By because the way, plug the website. It's a nonprofit, it's right? It's a nonprofit. We'll, we'll hook up to ours, but tell everyone what it is. The number 4hcm.org. The number 4hcm.org. Mm -hmm. And you go on there, and what do you find? You're going to find all the information you ever wanted to know about HCM and then some, including a program that we have called the Sudden Cardiac Arrest Risk Assessment Form. And our goal is to have that form distributed to every school child. What is the form? A bunch of questions? It's the American Heart Association, 12-point questions, but worded a little differently. Give us an example. Pulled out. So the American Heart document was written for doctors. It wasn't written for mom and dad to sit at the kitchen table and really think about. And when I ask you, Steve, do you have a family history of sudden cardiac arrest? Yes. You might say, well, I don't, I don't think so, because you're going to think of mom and dad. Well, well, my grandfather, absolutely. Okay, well, you might, good, you he say yes. He was 44, yeah. your, it was 43 in your family, and mine was, my grandfather was 1950, so 44, yes. So your grandfather died from a sudden cardiac arrest at 44. Yep. Have you had a cardiac evaluation? Yes. Have your children? No. Your children should. Come on. Yes. That's not overreacting? No, it's not. It's not overreacting because you have a risk factor within your family. I do. And sometimes it's only one risk I factor. I always forget that if it's me, it's them. It's exactly. 50, Thank 50, you so 50, much 50, for 50, saying 50. that because that's it. I have children too and he takes care of them. Okay, talk about this, Jimmy. I have, it, it, this runs in my family as well. And my nieces have it, my nephew has it, my daughter has the gene. She came positive for the gene for it. My son was skipped. So, but he is Dr. Trump. When did you, when did, oh, excuse me for interrupting. How old were they when you when you got them tested? The day they were born, for 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 their heart, not not genetic. Genetic testing was no, just a few the, years just ago. for their heart. The day they were born, you said I want to check this out. Absolutely, the day they were born. If if they had had it, doctor, would it have been picked up? 